and Bayesian population <laughs> studies project developing innovative simulation methods of migration and a Horizon, Pro Horizon 2020 project focused on various aspects of quantitative migration scenarios and forecasting. So we're very fortunate to have um, Jakob sharing his expertise with us today. Uh, the talk is titled Recent Advances in Migration Modeling, and I will turn it over to you now. Thank you so much. Oh, well, thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot for for the invitation to the to the formal demography workshop. I'm delighted delighted to be able to to connect with you, even if remotely. Uh, I hope you had a you, you had a few really good days uh, of intensive exchanges on formal demography so far, and and now we'll be we'll be just enjoying the conference part. So, the the. The topic of my talk is recent advances of migration modeling, and I will try to draw both on my own experience with modeling both theoretical and, and more practice-oriented of migration, uh, starting from an observation that this is something that if you really want to get a grasp of the area, there is, uh, there is a lot to read now. The, papers that and books that deal with formal migration modeling, forecasting, estimation, uh, theoretical simulation models are becoming more and more commonplace. This wasn't the case uh, about two decades ago when I started looking at migration. Now it's very much, very much mainstream. And of course, partly it's because there, there is a lot of policy interest in migration. Uh, policymakers want to uh, know how to possibly predict or control migration to the extent it's possible. And uh, this demand has been met uh, by quite a lot of supply from the side of the demographic uh, community. So what I'd like to talk about today is basically three things. First, you will see that quite a lot of what I'll be talking about will have the underpinning theme of uncertainty in it. So I'd like to start by talking about sources of uncertainty in formal migration studies and how can we deal with them. I'll then focus on recent developments in migration forecasting and then the recent advances in scenario making, formal scenario making, not just any scenario making, but this is a formal demography workshop. So we will be talking about formal uh, formal methods. I will try to be as non-technical as I can, uh, and then I'll be happy to I'll be happy to share the slides with you afterwards because I think I think I've uh, in the addendum I've prepared about five slides worth of reading materials. If any of the topics that that I'll be talking about piques your interest, so starting with what do we know about about migration processes as such, right? We know that they are the, migration is the most uncertain component of population change. It, it is quite consequential for population forecasts. At the same time, it's very uncertain and it's driven by so many different drivers that they're not, not only difficult to operationalize, but also uh, you know, to, 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 to actually capture in a coherent theoretical framework. So all this leads to migration processes being notorious for being, you know, quote unquote, barely predictable, statistically speaking, non-stationary, which renders many of the studies that claim to make precise predictions or orderly assumptions about migration quite suspicious. But we know some things. We know some things about regularities in migration. Uh, we know that the age patterns, the spatial patterns, uh, exhibit some regularities that we could rely on. We know that uh, stock, the mi migrant stocks change more slowly than, than flows, are less volatile. So that's, that's another thing that we could use. We know that we can disaggregate flows into uh, subgroups and types which will have similar patterns and which will have similar characteristics. And it's it's much preferable to, to model those than, for example, aggregates such as net migration. But the key challenges remain. One is, okay, we as, you know, as statisticians, as, as formal modelers, we are quite happy with the notion of uncertainty, but, but still we'd like to describe it and calibrate it properly. And then, 
there is there is an additional layer on top of that, which is about what to do with it, especially what to do it in applied work when we are talking to policymakers. So the, 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 now the whole the whole discussion, especially in the area of migration, moves beyond just trying to estimate or predict to trying to prepare to give the policymakers the tools to enable them being better prepared for whatever future might might materialize. And I'll just start this uh, talk by just showing you a, a quick taxonomy of different types of uncertainty, which we uh, which we came up with 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 Matthias Chaika in a project called Quantmic, which was mentioned in the in the introduction, and and. The key distinction I wanted to make is between epistemic, so, so the reducible types of uncertainty, the type of uncertainty where you can actually reduce it by learning more about the data, about the processes, and the one that is not reducible. So, you know, you know recall Donald Rumsfeld and the known unknowns and unknown unknowns. This is, this is going in the similar direction, only that we are talking here about the things that are in principle knowable and in and in principle, unknowable. And of course, when we, whenever we'll be talking about the data and measures, this is the very, very much the epistemic part. We can try to get a better handle of what's going on and estimate migration better. We can try to come up with better concepts and fitting definitions. We can come up with knowledge base about drivers and the, the way they work together. But then at some level, there will be always the residual, the uncertain residual, to do with uh, human behavior, to do with some systemic shocks that will just just appear, uh, you know, climate disasters, war and conflict, things just do happen that that very much can uh, can drive migration very quickly uh, uh, in in places when there was either none or, or completely different different patterns. And then there is the, the there is the the constatation that in in principle whenever we talk about the future the future is the future is open uh, and for migration this is true even more than for some of the other demographic components of change but if we even look at the at the, at the epistemic at the reducible part the the problems with me measuring migration are something that have been already flagged in the late 19th century, in the inter at the international conferences of the various international bodies that were trying to come up with a statistical system to look at population matters, already in uh, 1891, in 1905, the, the international congresses of, of statisticians were already there, um, taking a, a rather skeptical approach about migration and mentioning how difficult it is to manage to, 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 to measure properly. And in principle, this hasn't changed that much. Migration is still very difficult to measure. We've got a plethora of different concepts and sometimes even definitions, despite the efforts of the United Nations to harmonize them. We've, we've got data coming from different sources, uh, surveys, censuses, uh, registrations, uh, border enforcement statistics. Now you have all sorts of big data, so mobile data, phone locators, all of that together. All of them will have different features. All of them will have different biases. And at the, at the, at the, the bottom line is that you know, we'd like to come up with something that, that would enable us to at least, with some manageable degree of error, pinpoint uh, the numbers of migration, the size of migration flows or numbers of, of migrant stocks as they are. And we can do it by, by the means of formal modeling. So the, the, there have been quite a few methods proposed for that. Uh, what I'm showing you on, on the slide is a, is a snapshot from a, a database created as part of the Quantmic project, which was drawing from an earlier work in the project called Internal, uh, Integrated Modeling of European Migration, which built a Bayesian hierarchical model reconciling different sources on migration from coming from two different countries for a, uh, every specific flow. So the, 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 the idea was that by building a hierarchical model, we could, in principle, correct the 
reported measurements as imprecise as uh, as they are if we knew what definitions were used in different countries and what problems with data might have occurred so this is this is an example of how this uh, how such a how such a model works right the model can can take data from either one country or two countries for every given origin destination flow and produce uh, me, uh, produce an estimate with a measure of error. And the estimate can be additionally augmented by something that, that we call a migration model, which is basically a range of theoretical drivers uh, trying, to, uh, trying to deal with, um, uh, with missing data. Uh, there's a there's a very good question on the chat. Do 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 do, you, do we distinguish between international and internal migration? Most of the examples I will be showing will be about international migration. Uh, and with with internal, some of the some of the issues will be the same, but some will be slightly different. So, for example, the the differences in definitions apply mostly to migration between countries. This is something that for internal migration doesn't really feature that that prominently. At the same time, for for internal migration, we have other issues such as modifiable area unit problems or how big or how small the the areas that you're looking at will determine the number of migrants you are supposed to be uh, counting. So the, the state of the art is that when it comes to estimation, there are many estimates available. Uh, the, the estimates uh, using stock data to compute flows. So this is the work done by Guy Abel and also developed by, by John Azos and, and Adrian Raftery in, in, in Seattle. Uh, but at the bottom there, there is always some statistical structure that, that, takes, that takes migration and ideally takes different measures, different points of uh, information and tries to reconcile them and harmonize them in some way. In parallel to that, there have been legisl legislative efforts to, to harmonize migration definitions. Uh, that Europe, Europe is an example of that. So, so there, there was a new law in 2007 uh, mm -hmm. mandating European countries to adhere to a common def definition. And indeed, since, since this entered into force, data comparability has improved, but, but then uh, availability suffered. So, so some countries that used to submit data, for example, to the to the European statistical system, don't do it anymore because they would have to adhere to the more stringent definitions. Mm -hmm. So, so there are some there are some trade offs there. When it comes to moving forward, so when it comes to the the forward looking migration studies, the state of the art in forecasting and scenario making is that. There is a very well known and documented suite of time series model survey based intention survey based approaches that that look into short horizons a few years ahead. And this is well documented, well established now. The current focus driven very much by by policy demand is early warnings. So models like change point statistical change point detection, data based data driven approaches that are aiming to detect changes in the trends as they occur. So now casting, you can, you can think about it as well. This is very much the current, the current work. Scenarios is a different story because there's, there's been some progress. I'll talk a bit, bit about it later, but, but so far most of the state of the art has been about making some arguments and trying to chart the, the future of migration developments uh, to align with those, uh, with those narratives. There have been some progress. There has been some progress recently, also when it comes to formal scenario making, and I'll I'll come back to that in a moment. So, what is also quite quite important to recognize is that when we talk about migration and uncertainty, it is not only uncertainty per se that matters, especially from the point of view of the users of the estimates or the forecasts or or the scenarios. But they, the users will also have some sort of impact in mind. So what, what uh, can be proposed to manage that and also to communicate the, this, this uncertainty uh, 
could be something as simple as a, as a risk management approach, which an example of which you have here on the on the slide, where you can try to based on statistical properties of the of the trends, levels of predictability, so uncertainty, and the possible impact for whatever for for whatever policy purpose you, you may have in mind, you can try to juxtapose these two dimensions in a risk management framework, in a risk management matrix, to communicate the, the, the importance of different of focusing on different types of migration flows and as in this example. So what what do I mean by that? And and this also this also very much determines the predictive horizon that we can that we can think about. So what what we have what we have here is a sort of clear difference between the policy importance. This is this was for an applied work that we did for UK migration a few years back. Policy importance of the return migration of nationals, which are not very much of policy interest uh, at all. Or, or short-term migration, for that matter, which may differ in terms of the uncertainty, but generally for the policymakers, they they, they don't really uh, they don't really feature as their priorities. On the other hand, there will be the types of migration that will be very high on the political agenda. So asylum will be one, uh, irregular migration, settlement migration as well, because this is something that then uh, propagates through proper population estimates and numbers and uh, projections into all other domains like school places or, or hospitals or other public service provision. So, by by looking at it through through that lens, what we can uh, what we can achieve is, is we can we can take the uncertainty as it is, but whenever we are communicating the the uh, results of our uh, formal analysis of migration, we can uh, we can make our users aware of not only how much uncertainty is there, but also what it matters to them. <clears throat> so when 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 talking about predictions the 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 key features of migration forecasting as you probably have already gauged from from what what we've discussed so far are that predictability is generally very limited sensitivity to models to assumptions is very high and this this holds for early warnings and uh, short term now casting type applications as well as for traditional time series based or similar forecasts but still, there are things that we that we've learned over the past few years when we were working on different classes of models. On early warnings, when you try to detect changes in changes in patterns, changes in trends, uh, based on uh, slight deviations in the data trends, these kind of models uh, turns out can be strengthened by combining different data, data sources and different, I mean, both both the new forms of data, such as uh, such as mobile phone locators or Google Trends or uh, searches or, or other big data sources and more traditional forms of data, such as uh, uh, exchange rates, for example, which which can be also very, very volatile, but but turns out that put together different sources may be uh, May enable detecting changes in the trends of migration with some some really tiny, very short, but but still uh, non negligible horizon. Forecasts, typical forecasts, will have a hor useful horizon of up to a few years, uh, which uh, which is probably as good as it gets. Which means that also for applications in population projections when we're talking about the horizon of a few generations ahead, like the UN does in world population prospects or national statistical agency to do, we need to come up with something else. And then on the top of it, we've got th theoretical models. So we've got theoretical models where we can build lots of models with, with uh, masses of equations, such as economists do in central banking or uh, similar similar areas. And we could we could involve migration in such models, and we could use these models for for stress testing policies. So these models would not be predictive, 
But what they could provide is an insight into how migration might be responsive to some other things that change in a very complex and complicated system that is that is described by very many interrelated equations. Uh, at the same time, noting that when it comes to migration, the theoretical background is is quite quite weak. So whatever comes out of these uh, models, as formal as they may be, uh, has to be treated with with very much caution and definitely not in a in a predictive, in, not interpreted in a predictive way. So just to give you a few examples, so early warning models. This is um, this is from the from the work we did a few years ago, trying to identify uh, triggers of uh, change possible changes in signal in the number of asylum applications in Europe. This is uh, this is something that you can clearly see that peaks in twenty fifteen and and twenty sixteen. Uh, visible in different data sources. Uh, this was at the peak of uh, of what was called the, the asylum crisis in the in the Mediterranean, with, with many people crossing from North Africa to Europe uh, through quite uh, precarious uh, routes. Uh, and the the best results, as I said before, is is can be obtained. Uh, at least our early indications show by combining different data sources from different types when it comes to time series uh, time series models this is something that i've been looking uh, at since since uh, well th since this book and before uh, this, this book was published in 2010 looking at uh, the usefulness of applying time series models bayesian uh, bayesian statistical uh, approaches uh, in particular to migration forecasting, with uh, with the con main conclusion being that they can be quite useful over the very, very short horizons, uh, but uh, they also need to to be able to deal with the non stationarity of the of the processes that we are looking at, because migration is quite quite volatile, and uh, assuming stationarity for migration is uh, is problematic, and not only that, it's our uh, now, not only migration is volatile, but also uh, its volatility is volatile. So, if you if you imagine that you're modeling a time series with some some variance, this variance can also be modeled as a random process. So, we are we are entering into the the world of models such as such as gauge or stochastic volatility, which are quite can be quite useful for uh, this kind of modeling, predictive modeling of migration. But then the 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 main one of the main conclusions from this exercise was that there is no single model that can be judged best and uh, what can be done and again bayesian the bayesian approach is very good for that is is that different methods can be averaged to to help make the most of the information that's available and and of course the 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 models is one thing but the models have to be adopted to particular data situations so some some time series models will uh, will work well for processes that are relatively relatively stable but then when when processes are not stable such as asylum or or when there is a systemic shift in migration then probably all the all the models will deal, uh, end up doing quite poorly over a horizon of a few few years Few years ahead, and of course we can we can assess and we should assess not only the errors but also the calibration of the intervals. How well calibrated are our expectations of uncertainty uh, in in the forecast? So if if we say that something is uh, uh, you know nine, if something is ninety percent predictive interval, does it mean that really that if we run our forecast for a decade, that on average nine out of ten? Uh, observations will end up in this interval and so on. And you can you can you can extend these models. You can extend these models to to models with with some structure, including covariates, including uh, uh, additional variables. But the price to pay is is uncertainty. So so this is something that can be done and has been done. But the challenge is that if you include 
for example, economic or other predictors in your models, you have to predict those as well. So the the result is is uh, that um, uncertainty is being compounded and at uh, very quickly can get out of control. But let's now move on to the to the final part, which is the scenarios. The, the, the scenarios, as I mentioned at the at the beginning, are rarely formally quantified, especially for whenever they are done on a multi-country basis. And especially what is what is not what has not been done very much before is the, the 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 whole business of quantification of uncertainty. It is difficult, of course, uh, and people have been trying to look at drivers and then try to propagate the driver uncertainty into into uh, migration scenarios. But at the same time, this is uh, for the reasons that we've just mentioned before when it came to predictions. This is a very difficult and. Uh, and ultimately, um, you know, futile task because you, with migration, there are so many interactive drivers that uh, trying to properly account for all sources of uncertainty would end up with, uh, with the result uncertainty be, being so overpowering that it obscures the whole the whole picture. So what we could do instead, and this is something that we proposed in in the in the Quantmic project, is to focus on the relative frequencies of events and try to ask, answer for scenarios, for alternative migration scenarios, answer some, some questions based on the information we have from the historical data series, which we can model statistically and for which we can estimate some sort of probability distributions describing the, these processes. What are the frequencies? What are the rare frequencies that could uh, that could occur? What does it mean that we would? What would be the equivalent of a once in a decade migration flow for a given flow? Right. We we know the past history from from several years. We know the variability. We can we have a distribution, so we can have a quantile from that distribution. And. This is an approach that is uh, very much inspired by civil contingencies. So, so you know, the preparedness for events of different magnitudes is is a bread and butter of of civil contingency planning. And given how important pre preparedness is nowadays for policymakers in the area of migration, this to us seemed to be a natural way of trying to communicate uh, the statistical properties of what we see in the past samples as something that's actually quite potentially useful and hopefully not too difficult to understand by the by the end users so now what is a once in a decade migration flow what is a twice in a century migration flow this, these would be the the things that we would be looking at here and this is something that uh, that then can be propagated into scenarios so we can take the take the magnitudes that we assessed based on the past and and implement them as scenarios uh, for different flows. For example, here is immigration to the European Union from several parts of the world. So from North Africa, from other Europe and from uh, West Asia, either baseline scenarios, some, some sort of extrapolation of past trends or including the twice in a century, in this case, high migration events for a period of five, five years tapering off back to baseline over uh, over the next decade so this is something that again you, you can you can look it up in the uh, on the on the website uh, uh, hyperlinked on the slide but the the main thing here is that once we once once you do that you can start you can start answering substantive questions and i think if i'm not mistaken in the program i have seen that you have talked about replacement migration in the in the workshop before so if you have talked about replacement migration you will re you recall that the conclusion was of not only of the original un report but everything that followed is that that migration hardly matters for the long term population dynamics because the any reasonable numbers of migrants would change the trajectories of population especially structural trajectories only to a limited extent and this is this is something that you know we we did this approach we we followed the uh, we we followed the the approach for scenario uh, for scenario making uh, uh, 
as I've just described, and came out exactly to the same conclusion. So migration matters, okay, matters for the size of the population, matters for the for the size of the labor force, but structurally, it really doesn't matter that much. So, you know, the, 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 this is the answer to yet another answer to the question about can migration help uh, with help manage the challenges of population aging and the, the, the answer is not really because uh, aging is not really about migration and and uh, migrants also uh, age so so this is something that even if we go for very high numbers of migrants coming in or, or leaving this conclusion still very much holds and then there are, there are other there are other ways in which we can we can produce scenarios. The VAR models, the, the multivariate models that I mentioned before, also allow for something uh, like what's a called uh, impulse response analysis. So analyzing shocks, the effects of shocks of either migration or other variables to uh, some changes in the in the system. We, we don't quite like the word shocks which is why, why it's in in scare quotes here but because it, it sort of gives gives an an impression of something something un, 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 unwanted but but this is all about how would different variables react uh, if something increased by a certain order of magnitude say you know, one standard deviation or two standard deviations which is yet another way of constructing scenarios and stress testing stress testing policies and finally, the final the final thing I wanted to mention is that some models can be used also for explanation. Some formal models can be used for ex explanation. And I mentioned that there, there is no big theory of migration, and probably there can never be one. But there will be some small explanations of specific uh, specific topics within the migration studies, or stylized facts, you may call them. And... Uh, one way of looking at them is through simulation models or agent-based models in in particular. So here is here is a book from uh, that came out a couple of years ago that that looks at that in in detail. So what you can do is you can simulate decisions, you can simulate actions, and you can simulate. In our case, uh, in our case, uh, you can simulate migration routes. Uh, that was what we were interested in to try to come up with answers to some some uh, theoretical questions. What is the role of information, for example, in how routes are being fought? Can interventions uh, can, can interventions help in can some political interventions like information campaigns help prevent uh, deaths uh, due to perilous crossings such as those in, in we've seen in the Mediterranean that I mentioned before. So this is uh, th th this is one way of using such formal again formal formally written as a computer code and formally simulated models and their results, and the, these models can be additionally analyzed through statistical means. So so the, there is a very fruitful way of exploring the results of simulation models by using statistical models on top of them. So this is the whole area that's called uncertainty quantification. You you basically you build a statistical model of the underlying simulation model and try to look at the relationships between the inputs and outputs of your simulation model through a statistical lens. And the three main areas which are which are of interest here. One is what's called uncertainty analysis. So basically how much uncertainty is there when we look at the processes that we are studying. The second is sensitivity analysis. In this case, interpreted as which variables matter the most, i.e. where it, it's, it gives uh, the highest payoff to collect new data. And the third is calibration. So trying to align at least some of the model outputs with, with data. So the final... So the, the, this was really a, 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 a crash course in the state of the art of migration, uh, formal migration modeling. And just I just wanted to finish off with, uh, with a, a few sort of high level statements that given that we, we were talking really about one of the most uncertain population processes with so many drivers, so many actors, so many decisions, 
very large unknowable uncertainty, especially in the long horizons. Whatever we try to do has natural limits to it. So whatever we, we, we try to model the current migration, future migration, predict, simulate, has very clear limits and we need to be, whatever we do, we need to be upfront and, and honest about those limits. But this is not to say that we cannot do anything. Conversely, there has been so much development over the past, over the past, especially past decade, that that we are definitely in a different place now than, than where we were in terms of understanding how things work and also in terms of using different formal tools to stress test different uh, possible uh, policy solutions, uh, perhaps to, to, to illuminate some of the possible pathways that might occur. But the bottom line here is that that doing research on uh, on formal migration modeling is one thing. What really matters in the end is uh, how this is then communicated and portrayed to the users. And here is the, the the managing expectations of the users becomes crucial. So we need to make sure whatever we do is that this is so uncertain and can't be any different. Some of uncertainty will be there no matter. Uh, what and this is uh, something that is absolutely fundamental when it comes to migration modeling of whatever kind. So I'll finish there. The the the, the as I promised, the, there will be quite a few references in the slide deck. Uh, but if you'd like a non technical summary of of the talk, it's there on the. It's also available in the form of a white paper that we did write for a, for a, actually for a policy for a policy audience. And there will be a new book coming out for, uh, the, later this year, open access as well as the previous one uh, on uh, migration scenarios. So thank you, thank you very much for, for your attention. Um, we have time for maybe one question. We're running a little bit uh, behind on schedule. So one has a burning question. Yes, go ahead. Hi, Jay. Uh, my question is regarding if you have tried to use dynamic linear models to try to model in net migration, since you say that uh, there is a non-stationarity properties on this uh, component. So my question is if you have tried to use dynamic linear models, uh, the time series representation of these models, uh, to try to see if they are working right. So, so we we were actually we were looking at at, at, at this kind of models. That the slight problem with the time series is actually that that typically you don't have you don't have long series of data on the migration to start with, especially once you start looking once you start looking uh, uh, into disaggregations by origin and destination. So, so we we were, I mean, we were uh, trying to. Uh, trying to fit different different models, uh, but the, 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 the at some point there was a lim natural limitation coming from the length of the sample. So so that there is a you know when when we talk about you know maybe twenty observations and most of the migration data come in with with annual frequency that puts a natural natural limitations on the kinds of models that 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 that, that you can use. You can help it a bit with the through the Bayesian framework, because you can you can have some expert prior information in in input into the model uh, through that way to help you estimate the parameters. But uh, so 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 in a sense, yes, the, the, I I can definitely see the potential. But uh, but the there may be a practical challenge of building and estimating these kind of models. Especially when it's uh, coming from the from, coming from the sample from the available sample sizes, so there is a there is a bit of a trade off there. Thank you, Jakob, and thank you for for joining us. I know it's so late in the day for you. Um, we really appreciate it. Let's thank our speaker. Thank you. Thanks very much.